Today, we're gonna look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways and survived. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please ask the like button how to get to Bell's Canyon. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 2019, a 32-year-old United States Army soldier was stationed in Hawaii for training. This was his first time ever being in Hawaii, and so on his first day off, he planned to do some sightseeing. After doing some research, he settled on the Hawaii Volcano National Park as the first place he would go check out. This is one of the top tourist attractions in Hawaii that sees over 2 million yearly visitors. One of the main draws of this particular park is that it's home to one of the world's most active volcanoes, the Kilauea, that has been erupting consistently almost every year since 1983. On the evening of Wednesday, May 1st, John finally was given some time off, and so he hopped in his rental car and he made his way out to the park. When he got there, he was pleasantly surprised to see that it was not crowded in the least, most likely because he was there midweek, and so he paid his entrance fee, and then he started walking up a trail that would bring him up to this overlook that overlooked the caldera. The caldera of a volcano is the actual crater, the inside of the volcano where the actual lava comes out of. At the time John was at the park, the volcano was not actively erupting, and so there was no pool of lava inside of the caldera. However, the surface of the caldera, which was 300 feet below this overlook where John is, the surface was still 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, causing these massive steam clouds to billow up from it pretty much constantly. And so when John actually reached this overlook point and was looking out into the caldera, he was immediately disappointed because he couldn't see anything. And so as much as John craned his neck to try to get a better look down into the caldera, he was just totally obscured by the steam. Now he was up against a safety railing that prevented people from getting closer, but he figured if he could just get right to the edge of this crater and he could actually look down inside, he might be able to see all the way to the base of the caldera. And so he looked around and noticed there were no other tourists up there with him. So he thought about it for a second and then decided, yep, I'm gonna do this. And he stepped over the safety railing and walked right to the edge of this crater overlooking this caldera. And as soon as he got there, he suddenly had this unencumbered view of the space directly at the bottom of the edge of the cliff. He could actually see down into the caldera now. And so he got his phone out and he started taking some pictures and then all of a sudden the ground underneath him began to shift. And it shifted so quickly and so suddenly that threw him onto his back. And as he's laying on his back scrambling to get back up again, the ground underneath him just completely collapses, sending him careening down 300 feet into the scalding hot caldera. When John fell, another tourist did happen to walk up another nearby trail and they actually saw him as he fell. And so they called 911 and immediately first responders were on scene, but they were facing the same issue that John was, which is the steam was so intense inside of this volcano that you can't really see down into it. It. And so they had rescuers walking along the rim of the volcano and they had helicopters in the air, but it really wasn't doing any good. And in the back of all rescuers' minds, they knew that realistically, there's just no way John could have survived this. I mean, you can't survive a 300 foot fall, but even if you did, you couldn't survive being at the surface of the caldera that's over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. You die within a couple of minutes. But the rescuers pushed that thought out of their mind and they focused on being positive and just continuing to look for John. And two hours into their search, when it was totally dark outside and hope was just about gone at this point, somebody spotted John on a little ledge jutting out 70 feet down from that cliff he was standing on. When he fell, when the ground dissolved underneath him, he managed to land on this tiny little ledge. Had he fallen an inch left, an inch right, an inch forward, he would have tumbled to his death. There's no two ways about it. But he landed perfectly on the one ledge that could have saved his life. But he was so badly injured, he couldn't climb back up again. However, rescuers were able to rappel down to him, put him in a harness, get him back up, and he was able to make a full recovery. 
On July 12th, 2015, 30-year-old Christopher Lacun was out on his boat with his wife, his kids, and his best friend Robert, just off the coast of Port St. Lucie in Florida. Throughout the day, anytime Chris or Robert were looking down from the boat and spotted a rock pile, they would throw on their scuba tanks and dive down to attempt to find lobsters. Towards the end of the day, when they were looking down into the water, they saw what they thought was a rock pile at first, but as they kept looking at it, they noticed it had lots of straight lines, indicating it could be an underwater building. Chris and Robert noticed there was a yellow buoy floating on the surface right above where this building was underwater, and they thought they should probably go over and read it, but they decided, meh, it's inconsequential. We can just go down and check it out for ourselves. Now, if they had stopped and gone over and read the buoy first, they would have seen there was a warning on it that was telling people to stay back at least 100 feet from this underwater structure. But Robert and Chris didn't read that warning, so they put on their scuba tanks and they dove down into the water. And after only going down about 10 feet, they noticed there wasn't just one structure underwater. There were actually three huge structures. And so Chris and Robert looked at each other and they're totally amazed at what they're looking at. They had been scuba diving together since they were young kids and they'd spent a lot of time in these waters, but they had never seen these before. And so they were very excited to go down and have a look. When they got down there and they were only a couple feet away from one of these structures, Chris saw that the top of the building was just a square concrete slab. And then on all four sides, there were big concrete slabs. But at the top of each of the four walls of this building were what appeared to be openings. They were almost like windows at the top of the structure. And across the window was mesh all the way around, like a grate protecting things from going into the window and into the structure. And so Chris and Robert went right up to the mesh and tried to look inside of the structure just to see what was in there. But when they looked, it was just too dark inside and there was no way to tell what was in there. And so Chris is really disheartened because he really wanted to know what was inside of this building. And so he just grabs the mesh itself and just kind of tries to tug it in one direction, just to see if it would even move to maybe create some space so he could look inside. And it very easily slid all the way to the side, revealing an opening big enough for he and Robert to go through. And so the two of them look at each other and they just nod because they know they want to go inside and see what's in there. And so Chris went in followed by Robert and they found themselves inside of just this big empty space, the 70 foot by 70 foot space where there really was nothing inside of it, except down at the very bottom on one wall was the 16 foot wide opening that was the entrance to a huge tunnel. And from where Chris and Robert were at the top of the inside of the structure, they couldn't see into the tunnel. And so they decided by looking at each other and nodding once more, that they would just go down and try to look to see if they could see through to the other side of this tunnel. And so Chris goes down first, followed by Robert. And as they start making their way down, they both start to feel a current that's pulling them straight down. And as soon as they felt that, they both intuitively knew that they didn't want to be a part of that. And they started swimming as fast as they could back up towards their exit. Robert, who was a little bit higher than Christopher, was able to escape the pull of this current and got up to the top of the inside of the structure towards the exit. Chris, on the other hand, was not able to escape this current's grasp and was actually pulled backwards into the tunnel where he disappeared. Robert had actually turned around and saw his friend get pulled into that tunnel, but he knew there was nothing he could do. And so he just turned around, swam out of the structure and up to the boat as fast as he could to call 911. Once Chris had been pulled into this dark tunnel, he began tumbling backwards. He had no control over his body position. The current was just way too strong. And so Chris instinctively grabbed his mouthpiece and anchored it inside of his mouth. And then he grabbed his mask and did his best to keep that on his face. Because as he was tumbling, the current kept trying to pull those things off of him. As Chris tumbled through this pitch black tunnel, he began to realize that more than likely, he's going to encounter some very powerful pump that's sucking this water through this pipe in the first place, or some huge turbine that has something to do with pulling the water through this pipe. And in both of those situations, once Chris reaches the end of this tunnel, he's going to get cut up and get killed. And so Chris thought about pulling his mouthpiece out to just end it right then and there to avoid this horribly violent death. But he thought about his family, he thought about his kids, and he just couldn't bring himself to do it. 
And so he just continued to hold on to his mouthpiece and his mask and just continued to tumble with no control in total darkness, having no clue where he was going. After over five minutes of this just nightmare situation for Chris, he suddenly sees a very small flicker of light at the very far end of the tunnel in the direction they're being pulled towards. And all he can think of is, okay, well, whatever that light is, that's the area where I'm going to get killed. There's going to be some pump or some turbine right out there. And so he's bracing himself for this terrible, violent end to his life. But as they got closer and closer and that light continued to grow, Chris got a better picture every time he would tumble around he'd get a look and it did not look like there were spinning blades of death or some pump in there it actually looked like very peaceful calm water with sunlight pushing through it and sure enough after he got shot out into this lit up area the current kind of died down and stopped. Chris immediately began swimming right up towards the surface where there was actually land right in front of him. He was inside of what looked like this huge building and he saw there were people walking around with hard hats. And so Chris just pulled himself out of the water and began yelling for help. It would turn out Chris had been pulled into a nuclear power plant's cooling system. This particular nuclear power plant used a multi-level system where instead of just pulling the water in directly into the plant where it would be cooled and there would be you know, a pump of death or spinning turbines or something like that. Instead, there was a reservoir first where the water was dumped. And then after a while, that reservoir water would then get churned up into the cooling system. So Chris was just incredibly lucky that that was just the way this nuclear power plant was built because many other nuclear power plants, if he had done what he did, he would have been killed in a really horrible way. Chris would ultimately sue the power plant saying they didn't put up enough warning signs or enough deterrence to protect people from getting sucked into the these intake pipes and the power plant has countered by saying we put up enough deterrence you just went past them on purpose as of now it's unclear what came of that court case In 1990, 46-year-old Alex Kerstich was a marine biology high school teacher by day and a documentary filmmaker by night. In July of that year, he and three of his friends were in Mexico working on a documentary about sea life in the Gulf of California. They had already shot a bunch of footage during the daytime, and now they needed to go out and get some nighttime footage as well. On the evening of the 25th, Alex and his three friends boarded a 70-foot research vessel with all of their diving and camera equipment. They waited until just before sunset to leave the harbor and then it was a 30 minute transit to this area just north of La Paz that they had been told was very active at night. Once the ship was stopped they threw their anchor down and then turned on these bright spotlights and aimed them into the water and then one of the ship's crew members put a big piece of tuna onto his fishing rod and then cast it out into the water to try to lure some animals to the area. A few moments later a black mass suddenly came up to the surface ripped the tuna from the line and then vanished as quickly as it appeared. Alex and his three friends didn't get a good look at it. They saw it happen, but they had no idea what it was. So they told the ship crew member to put another piece of tuna on the line, throw it out there and see if they can get a better look at this thing. And so more tuna was put on the rod. It was cast out. And then seconds later, a black mass rushed up to the surface, grabbed the tuna and then went back down again. But this time with Alex and the others looking really intently at it, they picked up what looked like a red and white flash, like a strobe light on the skin of this creature as it descended down below low and they looked at each other and they thought could it be? And so another piece of tuna was put on the fishing rod. They cast it out into the water. And this time, before anything could come up and take it, deep down below, they see a flash of red and white all over the place, like a bunch of strobe lights going off. And then dozens of these creatures rocketed to the surface, fought over this tuna, and then descended back down into the deep water. And so now the men look at each other and they're grinning because they know the red and white flashing they are seeing is a trademark of a very rare creature. It's their skin changing colors. It's how they communicate with each other. And this creature is so rare that at this time, no one had actually filmed it alive. There was only footage of it dead after it washed up on shore. And so suddenly Alex and his team are thinking, man, our documentary is about to become legendary if we can just get in there and get the footage. And so the men eagerly put on their dive equipment, got their cameras and prepared to enter the water. Had they consulted with anyone who studied this rare creature, they would have been told that getting in the water with them was a horrible idea and could easily 
easily get them killed. These rare creatures are called Humboldt squids, and they are eight foot long apex predators that live in the deepest parts of the ocean. Because they almost never come up to the shallow waters, we know very little about them. What we do know is that like all other squids, they have eight arms along with two long tentacles that have all these suckers on it, and inside of the suckers are these teeth, these little daggers that they use to latch onto their prey, and then they pull their prey in towards their center, and at their center is this opening, it's their mouth, and it's called a beak, and it literally looks like a bird's beak. It's this hard thing that sits there and opens and shuts, and they use it to bite into their prey, and then inside of their beak is their tongue, and on their tongue are hundreds of sharp little daggers like more teeth that they also use to shred their prey. Typically, these jumbo squid will sneak underneath their prey and then suddenly shoot up, grab them with their two tentacles, and then drag them down to the deeper water where they feel safe, and then they begin the horrifyingly slow process of eating their prey alive because they have a gag reflex that prevents them from eating quickly. Humboldt squids are very intelligent, they're very social, and they're very aggressive towards humans, especially when they are in a large group or when they are eating. But of course, Alex and his three friends are not thinking about this. They're just eager to get into those jumbo squid infested waters and get this footage. And so they give each other the final okays. They're ready, their equipment's good to go. And they slip off the side of the boat into the water. Once they were in the water, they sank down to 30 feet, at which point they spread out around the squid that were still darting up to the edge of the boat to try to get more tuna. After a few minutes, of Alex and his buddies taking this great footage of these squids, a 14-foot shark suddenly comes into the mix and tries to eat the tuna off the side of the boat. But ironically, on its way out after not getting any tuna, the shark got its tail fins stuck on the actual hook and then became bait for the Humboldt squids. And seconds later, the squids began ripping the shark apart. And so Alex and his three friends decided to move closer to the drama to get some great footage. As Alex is right up next to this drama unfolding, he feels himself suddenly sinking in the water. And he's kind of fixated on getting the shot, so he's not really worried about why he's sinking. He's thinking maybe my buoyancy compensation off, maybe my weights are too heavy, but when he looks down, he realizes in horror, a Humboldt squid has wrapped one of its tentacles around his right swim fin. And so he instinctively begins kicking the squid's tentacle with his left leg, he gets it to release him, and in a panic, Alex begins swimming back up towards the surface, but he's still 40 feet away at this point from the boat. And at this point, the other squid have been alerted to Alex as now being considered prey. And so as Alex is going up, from behind, another squid squid comes up and wraps its tentacle around his neck. And his neck was the only area on his body that was not protected by his neoprene wetsuit. And so the daggers inside of the suckers on this tentacle dug into his neck, all around his neck. So his neck's being cut into and he's being strangled and being pulled down by this squid. And so Alex begins punching and squeezing and pulling on this tentacle, fighting for his life. And he manages to get this squid, the second one, also to release him. But by now he's been pulled down to 50 feet. He's got a ways to go to get back to the boat. And the other squid are all coming over. They're converging on him because they're all communicating that here's our prey. Here's our other meal. And so Alex tries to swim as fast as he can back to the boat, but he only made it a few feet before another Humboldt squid darted up and came right up to his face, wrapped both tentacles around his entire head, blinding him. And he immediately felt the beak pressed up against his face. And it was opening and closing, trying to bite him, but it was biting down on his dive mask that was basically saving him from having his skull crushed by the squid. The squid became frustrated because it's not digging into Alex's flesh, and so it readjusted its grip on him by sliding down to his midsection, where immediately it begins pulling him down violently in these pulsing bursts. And so all Alex starts doing is punching and hitting and doing everything he can to get this thing off of him, and then for some reason it does release him. Maybe it was just so frustrated that it could not puncture into him. And so Alex is now down to about 60 feet, and he starts swimming as fast as he can with all these squids all around him, but for some reason, none of them attacked him. And so Alex swims up to the boat, and before he actually gets on board, he looks down back into the water, and there's just dozens of these squids that are flashing red and white at each other, just kind of hovering in the water, not making any move towards him. It was like they were just watching him. Alex sprinted up that ladder, got into the boat, and shortly after, his three friends came out of the water as well. They were unharmed. 
Alex had deep cuts all around his neck from where the tentacles had driven their teeth into his throat. But besides that, he was physically okay. Mentally, he was a train wreck and was very traumatized from this event, as you could imagine. Today, his encounter with the Jumbo Squids is a thing of legend in the diving community. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us a timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please ask the like button if they know where Bells Canyon is. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ball and Shorts, where I post random short videos and lost episodes. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.